going to speak a lot about what's on the test to make sure that you do as well as possible. Uh, remember that this is your generic phase diagram. Looks like I've done a water-like one. Notice that I had the arrow go up because um, I, I, you know, the, people can pressurize materials to fantastically high levels, but I guess eventually you would crush an atom. No one has ever been able to do that because what would you, what would you use to do it, right? <laughs> we don't know. So this is why I have this little arrow here just to indicate pressure goes higher and higher. And um, another thing, I, so and then I have this dotted line to show the critical phase. And I think this is not the right pin, but anyway, remember that the critical phase is its own phase. And um, let's see, I guess one other thing I didn't mention that I didn't want to emphasize for this class, so don't worry, this will not be on the test. But just so you know, that if you go up to high enough pressure, if you go up to high enough pressure, you can actually have more than, there are different solid phases that are accessible. And uh, of course, you can be not volume. Well, yeah, I'm just so used to basic things. I'm just so used to P versus V at this point, and I'm not looking at my own notes, which is not helping. Thanks for pointing that out. Right. Intensive variables. Okay, that's, if I was on the test, the way I would have figured that out is I would have noticed that I was not talking about intensive variables. It doesn't make sense to talk about extensive variables and phases because if an ice cube is very big, it's still an ice cube. That's one way to think about it. Um, now again, I'm not going to put this on the test, but I did want you to know that there are different solid phases. There can be other triple points, and what those are are those are different crystal structures, since solids are crystalline. You can get um, most, most things want to form one type of crystal structure, but if they're under specifically pressure, then they might uh, rearrange their atomic configuration to form other crystal structures. And so you can get some funkiness. You can get behavior like this. Um, you can get and notice you can get other triple states, so this is the primary phase, would be phase one or two. We're often given Greek letters for all the reasons I've already said. We just tend to use Greek letters. Uh, the triple, there can be more than one triple point. Um, for the engineering class 340, well, three, wait, 342, which is mostly engineers, we actually spend a lot of time on high pressure. Um, notice I did not draw a quadruple point because there can't be. That's still true. Uh, so anyway, there wasn't much to say about that. And in terms of why are there open planes, why are there lines, why is there a triple point, we use that, we uh, define that with the Gibbs phase formula, which is T plus P. Um, oh, here, why don't I, uh, in terms of review, why don't I actually just go through the whole thing. Uh, we said that uh, you also control how much you add. Remember, C is the number of components, and then if you have an ice cube, you'd have to include all the components in the liquid in the ice cube, so you would double them, so PC. Uh, but we remembered that you actually overcounted. Uh, you overcounted because if you poured ethanol into water, that's, that's the only thing you do. You only add one thing, so you're not adding two. So you've got to remember that uh, for every phase, the number of the number of mole fractions have to add up to one for every phase, so that's something you can't control. And then you also have to take into account that if you stipulate you have an ice cube floating, then um, the, the chemical potential of the ice cube and the liquid has to remain the same. And that gave us this number of equal signs. And this ends up being uh, two plus C minus P. Okay, so if I apply that to, again, it, you should recognize this as water because of the way that the um, solid liquid line slopes to the left, which is very unusual, actually, mitigated by the fact that water is very common. Water, by the way, does have, I think, nine different solid phases. Again, um, different crystal configurations, whatever, not on the test. Okay, this is, a one, this is for one component. Again, this is water. And because if I see, okay, how many degrees of freedom, again, which remember are things you can change and not <coughs> tinker. Um, what can you tinker and not completely blow the system, essentially? So if it's just water, it's 2 plus 1 minus, um, if, I, if I'm here, it's 2 plus 1 minus 1. So that's just 2, which is just T and P. So I can still modify T and P. Um, to some degree. Now, it, it, it's not, you're not allowed to do an outrageous 
trans, you know, oh, but what if you what if you raise temperature until you have a gas or a critical? Well, well, that's screwed up. Well, you're cheating, all right? You know you're cheating. So, um, uh, and then what happens is now again, I, I don't know whether I will cover this or not. I'm still debating this. Uh, but the reason this is useful is when you have more than one component. And again, let's do our ethanol and water. Uh, in which case I would have 2 plus 2 minus 1, so that's 3, so that's temperature, pressure, and then the other thing would be mole fraction. Depending on it, water or ethanol, I would probably um, put it in context of what I poured into the box. Probably that would be ethanol, though, would be. And so those are the three things I could change. And in terms of the phase diagram, what you would have to do is you can't... Uh, so now I've got three things that would be P and T, and then, like, in the board would be another axis, and that would be mole fraction. Again, let's just say mole fraction with ethanol just for the heck of it. Um, the problem is I can't draw that in two dimensions. I couldn't put it on a single piece of paper. And if I had my Kindle, uh, even when the technology becomes 3D, I, I wouldn't be able to still look into it and really, you know, it's, it's hard to look inside of a solid object, right? So what happens is when you have multi-component phase diagrams, what you do is you just assume that you're at one bar pressure or one atmosphere. And so what you then do is you, you do temperature versus composition. And I just want to make you aware of that just in case I don't ultimately cover it in this class. But that's what you do when you have multi-component phase diagrams is that you know that for the most part you operate at one bar pressure. Of course you do. One atmosphere, one bar. Uh, and mole fraction. So what you end up doing is you end up drawing a couple of different phase diagrams on top of each other. And you just assume you're at uh, constant pressure. And again, the reason that's useful is when those things are actually reacting. You can see why it's more for engineers than you folks. And that's, again, why I may not um, pick it. Okay. Again, we're still just reviewing. And let me remind you now, this part is definitely on the test, which is I went to a a little overly long explanation uh, to make sure that you, you could do this, understand what the change in chemical potential is in a constant P and P world. And again, I spent about 10 minutes doing something that was actually kind of trivial, which was, it's basically delta G because I'm in a constant T and P world, and I'm going to choose the delta G form of chemical potential. They're all equivalent, but I'm going to choose the delta G form. And the way you switch from delta G to delta U is you just put everything per mole, as always. And again, if, if it matters, I will specify that you do all this for one mole. In case you forget these little m's, it won't matter. I, it's, a little, it's just a little m. I'm not going to count off points. Uh, but anyway, it, it is important, but uh, whatever. Okay, now what we did with this was uh, we started making graphs. And you can imagine I might have put these on the test. And what I would do is want you to be able to manipulate these, chemical potential versus temperature. What I think is kind of neat is, hold on a second, let me, I have three old pins and one new one, and I don't know which one's which. So we're going to just play the guessing game here. OK, I know that of all phases, the solid is, a, if I have a box with a material, let's, let's just stick with water, and it's cold, it's a solid. Therefore, the solid has the lowest chemical potential, the gas and the liquid are somewhere higher. Why? Because I know that frozen water is a solid. Okay, but I know if I heat things up, that the liquid, the liquid will eventually become lower, so it has to start higher, but eventually it has to overtake in a negative going way. It has to overtake the solid, and it will do that because the slope is the entropy per mole and the entropy of the liquid is higher. So I don't quite know where, it, where its intercept is, but whatever. It uh, does take over. And of course, this would be the melting. I'll just write it melting. This will be the melting temperature. And of course, the same with the gas. The gas has to be higher in the liquid region. Uh oh, sorry, let me put the. There we go, you know, it's a liquid, and this is a gas, it's a little funky, uh, and then this is of course the vaporization, the boiling point, uh, what am I going to call it, boil. Okay, that's the boiling point, there you go. Um, something like, uh, so this is basically everything, let me do CO2, 
Um, I just want to show you the ways you can manipulate this temperature versus temperature potential. Uh, the way that this guy works is that the solid, the reason that CO2 doesn't, uh, doesn't melt, it just sublimes, right? Dry ice is that uh, here's the gas. So it goes from straight to solid to gas. And here's the sublimation, sublimation temperature, which is pretty cold. Uh, the scale is kind of funky here. Uh, and the, the issue with the liquid is, is that the liquid is up here. The liquid's up here, so that's why it just gets bypassed. Anyway, hint, hint, if I have graphical things, I might ask something like this, which is really easy, right? Uh, you can see, I mean, you're seeing basically everything I could think of to ask. Oh, there is one other bit. Remember pressure. Remember that we can work out phase diagrams. Uh, I'll do the pressure. I'll do one example for most things, which is that um, here's a solid at low pressure, and then at high pressure, uh, we're up here. You, you might remember that I had a little trouble drawing. This is always a little problematic. And uh, for liquid, uh, since the change in chemical potential, uh, so it gets higher with pressure because the conjugate is positive dm, and so that's why I draw the lines higher up if I if I pressurize it. And then, of course, most liquids are less dense, so they're more sensitive. They're more sensitive uh, to pressure, and and I see therefore that the melting is um, the melting temperature increases. So that's what I'm just representing it here. And that's how I know, and I get this right, P versus T. This is how I know that my solid liquid line slopes normal, which is to the right. And remember that this is a, um, the density of liquid is less is yet less than the solid. So uh, the thing about this is now that should uh, you know to guide you make sure your gut leads you in the right right, right direction. Um, this should be in accordance with your just general feeling. If you're in the test and I ask them like this, you should just say yeah that does sound right and that's correct. Remember, when we do 344, that will never be the case. That was just a warning. Um, so the, the funkiness is water, which is the opposite. Uh, and again, water is very unusual in the fact that the solid actually floats. Solids generally don't float, but with water it does. Uh, and unfortunately, it's the most common thing in the world next to dirt. So uh, that's why I do have to cover that. And then last bit in terms of review uh, is just to remind you, um, I won't. Uh, I won't spend. I'm spending way too much time on this. Uh, we talked about how if the chemical potential of phase alpha is equal to the chemical potential of phase beta, I mentioned to you that the change in the chemical potential of phase alpha would have to be equal to the chemical potential of phase beta, and therefore, uh, I was um, actually. I don't think for once I was not horribly rushing. I don't think I was towards the end like I normally am. I was able to derive this relationship between, um, so what this is, this is the P versus T slope between any two phases. So, uh, sorry, I, I told you I would draw this in so times. Let me do a P versus T di phase diagram. Okay, this is, this is the slopes of the lines I'm drawing. Uh, for water, water, the slope again, the, the solid liquid gas, the solid liquid slopes the wrong way because the change in volume, again, is negative, and negative lines slope to the left, right? Uh, for most other things, it's to the right. So anyway, um, yeah, so the, this defines the slope, and what we're going to do today is then bring dt over and integrate it, and then giving a starting point, well, excuse me, giving, given a starting point, the triple point, you'll be able to figure out where the lines go. Um, so remember that's what I call it, it's a, it's some, they, the kind of thing physical chemists don't, uh, we're a little neutral on, 
is like when I derive equations, I just want you to tell me H2O. I just want to hear just that from you, and I should be able to tell you everything. I should be able to tell you the structure. Uh, uh, you know, aside from, you know, I know organic, you know, you can have 10 different structures for a given formula. Okay. Aside from that, you get my point. If you tell me H2O, I should be able to tell you it's water. I should be able to tell you everything about it. I should be able to tell you it's delta G. I should be able to give you its phase diagram it, with only that information. Um, but we're not, you know, in grad school, that's what we're working on. We're not in grad school yet. So when it comes to defining the line, again, that's what we're doing today. I need a starting point. And that's, again, not, I, I, I shouldn't have you tell me anything more than it's H and two, you know, it's H two O, and that's all I should need. But for the purposes of this class, I need a starting point. Anyway, I'm kind of rambling now. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to say? Oh, in terms of uh, uh, question, uh, density of liquids less than solid. That's for that's water. for everything but water. But water. Right, right, yeah. So uh, remember what I, I think I did say that right. Watch, watch the videos you can use. That's why I have videos. Uh, one other thing to, to note here, in case. You know, I don't like to not prove things. I mean, I'm hoping you look at this. Yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. That, that's good because it's true. Uh, there's two ways to think about. I mean, I've proven that this is true. When we did the ice cube in water, when I first introduced chemical potential, there's nothing wrong with that. This guy, actually, to do this correctly, that's a grad school thing where I prove to people that this has to be true. But here's a way to accept this. Let's say that this was a chemical reaction. If this was a chemical reaction and you're at equilibrium, then again, I did prove it correct that this, this is true. This is when chemical reactions stop. Product, you know, products and reactions are done. That's when the chemical potentials are equal. But if this wasn't true, then basically you would be describing chemicals at their, um, at their um, transition state, right? If you're not at the transition state, uh, you're either products or reactants, then this part is, is true. Um, and again, that's a graduate school kind of concept. Another way to think about this is that if I have, a, okay, equilibrium, ice cube floating in water, perfectly zero degrees, perfectly one bar, it's not possible to keep things perfect, but let's say it is. It's basically saying if you poke it with the stick, it's still going to be okay, which kind of makes sense. It should be okay. Um, all right, so now a bunch of review. Let's get back to this thing. Now, when it comes to defining these lines, that's a problem. Entropy is always a problem because, again, I've got no entropy meter uh, question up there. Yeah. Is that supposed to be, I'm just checking out what's right, is that negative delta S then over here, or is it just? No, no, it's just delta S. Right, no, no minus sign. Um, no, there's no minus sign, right? Sorry, I got the wrong page of my notes. Uh, no, no, I got, it, I got it right. So, okay. Um, I don't know which pin is which. Let me try to switch pins again. I'm, I'm having trouble seeing this. Okay. No entropy meter, but what I'm going to do, I always feel that this is a little cheap, but it, yeah, I guess this is right. Um, so let me just represent this by, oh, I guess I did get it right. What the heck do I do with that? <laughs> it turns out that if I'm committed to a P versus T world, you know, if I just decide I want to know what's here, you know, just like throwing a dart, what's there? I do have a well-defined pressure and temperature, so I'm allowed to do an analysis in a constant P and T world, just like I've been saying ever since we got past the second test. If I'm in a constant P world, and let's do some test review, what, what is, um, what's heat in a constant pressure? What thermodynamic variable is responsible for heat? But only in a constant P world. No. No. <laughs> You've all guessed everyone except the right one. You. Okay, I'm hearing you. Uh, which one? H. Enthalpy, like you had in high school. H. Remember that heat. Heat and heat and work are our basic factors. Heat and work are are at the basement right of all thermo. U is equal to, to changes in heat and work, and U is heat. Uh, you guys got to start, if you're, you need to start studying for the final, this will definitely be on the final. Obviously, this was, the, this was 
the basis of all of test one and two was what U is, changes of U is in this heat and work. U is heat if you're at constant volume, that means no work. H is heat if you're at constant pressure. Okay, so the way to make this practical, um, again, you know, if working with entropy is always just very difficult, is I want to um, think of entropy as, it, as the change in heat over temperature, and heat is enthalpy if I'm at constant pressure. So therefore, what you can do is make this substitution, um, delta H. And again, we still have heat per mole over T delta V. Again, per mole. OK, see, now, remember, no entropy meter, but a heat meter. Yeah, uh, calorimeters, yeah, definitely. Calorimeters are some of the best instruments <coughs> humanity has ever made. All right, I've got tables of delta H of vaporization, tables of delta H of melting, and sublimation. You can find delta H's of sublimation and whatnot. Um, that's a little bit more esoteric. Just Google it, as esoteric as that is. Okay, now you can see what I can do. I can bring delta T over and define lines, again, with a starting point, which is unsatisfactory from my point, and, um, and then work with them. And you have a question on your homework, by the way, that I forgot which, uh, did I ask the water on Mars question? What did I do in, on the homework? Do you remember? None of you have looked at the homework. Is that right? That's no, actually what I'm... There's no water on Mars question. Yeah. Wait, what is it? I forgot. I asked a question. I don't quite remember which question I asked. Sorry, it's just I, I have like a, a database of questions and then I take one and I change it around like I did on the test. But anyway. Um, well, here, all right, so let, let me solve this sucker and then I'll show you how you can use it. Uh, let's see. Now, again, the name of the game is we've been doing this for a while. Let's do solid liquid. Okay, solid liquid is the one that's uh, different than solid gas, which is sublimation, and, gas, and liquid gas, which is vaporization. Uh, because when you look at the phase diagram, the funny thing is that I, I need to define three lines, and two of them go to gases, right? So I've got three lines to define because there's only three lines, and two of them go to gases. And that means that the solid liquid, the one I'm doing now, is going to be different. So just understand that. Okay, so uh, regardless, uh, what I've got is a change in P is equal to delta H, and I can also define the process now, remember that IUPAC, you define what's happening in this little spot here. Fusion is technically melting. Uh, I don't know why, but whatever. I have no idea why they decided to call it that. And again, I think per mole. And delta V per mole, uh, fusion. Uh, these, these are, again, data I have to give you. It's been looked up. Changing T over T. So uh, I just moved the key over here so that it would be clear what to do next, which of course is integrate. And uh, again, just the mechanics of what I'm trying to do is, as I've been babbling on several times, that I have to give you a starting point, and the starting point in the phase diagram has to be a certain temperature and pressure. I'm not calling it P naught T naught. I'm not calling it one bar. Uh, 298 because I don't know that I'm on the solid liquid line in that case. So what I usually like to do is I like to give you the triple point because I know that I'm on all three lines at once. And then the um, the next thing is P2, T2. Sorry, this is in the way now. Uh, I don't want to. Okay, P2, T2. This is your data point, right? So I, I'm trying to build this graph. I've given you this point, and now what I'm asking you to do is, is derive the rest of the points. And what you do is you go point by point by basically setting this one and asking what this one is. You could do the opposite, whatever. I mean, you know, flip, whatever floats your boat. Uh, regardless, let's solve it. And again, I see that my use of the board is historically bad. I don't know why I've been doing this so much lately. I've been doing derivations left to right instead of up and down. So uh, I'm going to trust that you are calculus friendly enough to do what I'm, I'm doing, which is just natural log, right? 
the main thing I've got to remember my changes of m, my, my fusions of that there's an m, and then what I end up with is a natural log of t2 over t1. Again, t1 is defined. And there you go. All right, so real simple, real simple stuff. Now, I want to just take a, just, all right, there's not much else to do with this. And um, again, there's a homework question that I, I can't remember if I gave you a gas or a liquid one, but anyway, um, if I have a question like this on the test, this is my giveaway question because all you have to do is plug in numbers. Uh, of course, I have to give you uh, P1, T1, I have to give you the, the thermo stuff. Uh, what to look out for is uh, be careful with not using SI units. Um, you would need to use meters cubed, you would need to use joules. You will find on, I give you what I find on Google, that would be in kilojoules. Don't do something like use Celsius. I've seen someone do that once. These would be in Pascals. Remember, use full SI units on these. Um, this is one of those times that, remember in the beginning of the class, whenever you had to do anything with volume, it was okay to use liters and kilopascals because they canceled each other. You don't have pressure here multiplying volume. This is why you need to use meter to cube. But anyway, uh, one thing I want to point out is why did I draw, uh, whether it's sloping left or right, why did I draw a line and I drew these kind of more exponential light? It's because this little equation here is very much in the form of y equals mx plus b. Uh, so this is m, and this is like an x. So notice that I drew these like a, a line with a strong slope, a positive or negative. Uh, that's because, okay, this part's brainless, right? Uh, and this is, this is a pretty big number because the change in volume, the change in density is measurable. I mean, that's why you, you know that solids sink unless you're water. You know that. Yeah, your guts tell you the right thing. But the difference is actually still kind of small if you sit there with a calculator. And that makes this a big number, and that's why the slope is quite quite strong. That's my word for it. Natural logs are actually pretty similar to, natural logs are rather linear. Um, they're monotonically increasing, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Who knows what that means? That no one? Right? <laughs> 344, the calculus is very extreme. If I do something and you don't know it, you have to say something. Monotonically increasing means if I go this way, it goes that way. It doesn't have to be straight, but it always goes up. So look out for that because 344 things do get harder. Okay, natural logs are basically not just not that different than lines themselves. So that's why I drew it this way. Okay, two more and then we're done. So we actually will get out a little early today uh, because what I cover next is... Um, what I want to cover after this are surfaces and bubbles, uh, which are basically, remember cells are basically like little oil, oil drops essentially, uh, where the, the surface, the cell wall is basically soaked. Actually you can, you can actually use, yeah, the, the materials in a cell wall actually is a substitute for soap. It would be kind of a crazy way to make soap, but it could be done. Um, so that's what I'm going to cover after this class. So I don't want to start that today, especially with the test. So let's do the vapor liquid line next. I have no idea which term is the right one. Okay, so uh, let me do my funky um, right, uh, left to right derivation. Uh, the correct IUPAC terminology is vaporization, so this one does make sense. Remember that this is delta S is delta H over T. Um, okay, now this is where I'm going to do something a little different. In which case, uh, remember that, uh, and I'm not, I'm actually not going to do, again, sorry for my weird use of the board today, I can't seem to help myself. Uh, this is, uh, vaporization is liquid to gas, so if you calculate the change, that's going to be the, the molar volume of the gas minus the molar volume of the liquid. If you get that confused, I'm, I'm not going to count off for you. If, if um, technically you have to memorize that vaporization means liquid to gas, not gas to liquid. If you get that wrong, technically you're going to have a minus sign somewhere. Don't worry about it. I'm not going to, that, that's a detail that 
again, if you, at your job, if you for some reason had to figure this out at your job, you would be careful enough to get it right. So I don't expect you to memorize those kind of details. But regardless, the detail does remain that this is gas. Um, <laughs> yeah, I forgot. Ga liquid to gas. Therefore, the change in volume is the gas minus the liquid. Now here's the thing. If um, you know, for water, if, if you look at this for water, um, let's, let's take the volume of the gas, volume per mole of the gas minus the volume per mole of a liquid over the volume per mole of the gas. Basically what you get is 99.9%. In other words, you can just substitute the change in vaporization per mole of um, the mole gas. Uh, sorry, I'm kind of doing this the wrong way. I just I, I hadn't really thought of this. So if you get the if you get the um, the change in volume of the gas minus the liquid to 99.9 percent .9 is correct just to use the volume per mole of the gas. 99 percent. Okay. Now why, yeah, hopefully that's kind of obvious and you as chemists should be cognizant of enough, you know, like water, 18 mils is a mole. You know that a gas is about 22.4 liters at zero and it's 24 point, what, 24.5 at 25, something like that. I, I, I don't quite remember, but anyway, something like that. Plug in those numbers and you'll see it's 99%. Okay, why am I doing this? Can someone give me a formula for the volume per mole of a gas? You see, if it has T's and P's in it, I might have an issue, right? Remember, I can't let P's and T's be hiding here. Before, you see what I did? I let uh, the delta H and the delta V just fall out. I didn't think that there was a T or a P hiding in it, but I think there's a T or a P hiding or both in, in one of these guys. Is there? <laughs> it would be what? All right, right. Uh, what I heard was NRT over P, and I think you're off by one letter. RT over P. I was going to ask the left shark, but yeah, it's RT over P. <laughs> left from my perspective. Uh, per mole. All right, little, little factoid. Okay. All right, so let's get back to this. And you can see why this is going to be a little different. Um, uh, and I'm going to have to do some funkiness with my um, with how I work the board as usual. I'm trying to remember the symbol. I use different symbologies than the book uses. So where this gets a little funky is uh, I've got an R. I've got a T squared. Oh, and I got a P on top. Remember, this is one over, right? And I already had a T, so now I've got another T. Okay, so now I'll just keep working down. I just don't want to be consistent today. Uh, well, here, yeah. we got a little bit of real estate. So, I got the change in P. I got it. I got to take all the variables to one side. And blah blah blah. So here's this over R. And then I'm going to put all the partials and put all the variables together and integrate and integrate. I'm missing a minus sign. Um, no, 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 I got it right, I got it right. Okay, and of course I will just, I, as usual, I give you P1 and T1, and you'll be looking for P2 as a function of T2. Since this is a graph, of course, what you do is you plug in various T2s, that gives you the corresponding, that's the X's, that gives you the corresponding Y's, and that's how you build up the graph point by point. Okay, let's see what this does. Working down from there, and uh, and again in terms of working numerical problems, the only trick there is just to remember to use full SI. Be careful of kilojoules. I don't think I'd be so cruel as to give you a change in volume of liters. You would have to turn that to meters cubed. I probably would give it to you in standard SI because that's just a little too cruel not to. Okay, what you end up with is natural log, P2. Maybe you can remember on the first Friday I, wrote, I, I mentioned to you that you had to know how to integrate 1 over x, and it was a natural log. 
Uh, integrating 1 over t squared, remember the derivative of 1 over t gives you uh, t squared, 1 over t squared, oh, there's a minus sign, so you add a minus sign to prevent that from happening. Okay, we've got 1 over t2, uh, upper limit minus the lower limit. Uh, so there you go. Yeah, that's really about it. Now this is also going to be the same for the solid vapor sublimation. Not something you think about too much, not that many things sublime. CO2 is of course the, one of the materials that sublimes. That's it, to chemistry, we, we use a lot of CO2 for cooling chemical reactions. Uh, let, me, let me put this in a more practical tract form so that I know how to graph it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the exponential to both sides. And uh, what I end up with is just this. Sorry, I should write a little bit bigger. So I end up with an exponential of all this jazz. Good thing I'm kind of done, it's like my pen is dead. So I know this is one of the dead ones. And what I see here, the thing I got to, oh God, this is why I don't like old pens. Um, that's hard to see, isn't it? Um, what I see here is a, is a very much of an exponential rise. Let me, for the last time, draw my P versus T diagram. Okay, I've already done the solid liquid, and again, I'm doing water. And I've already shown it's very linear-like, because natural logs are very linear. But look at this guy. This is very exponential-like. I just got to remember that negative, <coughs> negative exponentials um, go downward like this, and positive exponentials go upward. So uh, don't draw that. It's not a big deal. But what I got to remember is that, of course, I like to start at Let's do the liquid vapor, like I said I was doing. Uh, this would be a bigger number. If I start at the, the triple point, this would be a bigger number. And one over a bigger number is a smaller number. So this is negative, negative. So this is positive. So this is an upward going. So you may have noticed that when I, when I was doing this, I was always drawing exponential rising curves. I did it on purpose. And the same is true here. Exponential rising curve. Now, in terms of where do you stop, how do you know to stop the critical point? I told you this theory is not exact. Where, 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 when does the critical turn to plasma, right? Uh, these theories don't have that in there, and that's why they're kind of unsatisfying for a chemist. Um, but yeah, there you go. Now, again, the thing to look out for on a test is um, expect me to be clever with this. Uh, I could ask, like, if, um, God, I keep forgetting what's... So I, you know, I can say I, I, I have like 20 questions like this and I just use a different one. And then I also change the numbers because uh, Coopers and whatnot has all my material on there. I know that. So I always pick a different equation, different system, and then ask, and then change the numbers to boot. But one thing you could do is you could, um, you could figure out whether at a certain temperature and pressure, whether, sorry, at a certain temperature, whether you could have, whether it was feasible to have a, uh, a liquid or a gas present, like, um, oh, let's say, like, I was asked a question, like, okay, let's say that you're here. Um, I could ask, what pressure is the, uh, do you form a, um, sorry, if you're at this temperature, call that T prime, what, where, at what pressure would you form a liquid, and this would be water, what you would do is you, you plug that, oh, right here. You plug that into this equation. Uh, so I've given you the triple point. I've given you a new temperature that gives you a new pressure. That would give you P2 right here. And you can say, oh, well, uh, that pressure would be at uh, 1,000 gigapascals. And then you can, then, and then maybe this is like the surface of a moon or something, and the pressure is not that high. And the answer is that you could not form a liquid uh, because the pressure on this moon or on Mars or Mercury or whatever is not high enough. That's the kind of question I could ask. And um, yeah, that's, that's really, uh, and again, just look out for units. And yeah, that's really about it.